Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our free webinar today on improving your force measurements. Uh, we do have a uh, guest speaker today, Henry Zumbrun from Morehouse Instrument, uh, who was so kind to uh, volunteer to provide us some good information here on force measurements and calibration. Uh, next slide there, Henry. Yep. Uh, my name is Tracy Sarzen. I'm the president of PGLA. I do a few uh, webinars uh, throughout the year uh, with particular, uh, again, volunteers or just uh, outside folks that we thought would be uh, great to bring on um, to talk about particular topics uh, that would interest you know, our calibration laboratories. Uh, we also do uh, testing laboratory topics as well. Um, but this is our, our first one we've really done in a while um, on really a, on a calibration topic. Um, so today we're going to uh, have Henry present, um, talk about uh, force measurements using the ASTM E74 methods. Um, he's going to talk about some tips and challenges surrounding around that calibration method. And then we're going to have time for some question and answers at the end. Next slide. Yep. yep. Okay, just some webinar housekeeping. Uh, this webinar has um, is being recorded. Um, the uh, as usual, they are available on our website shortly after the completion of the webinar. Uh, there are the links there to uh, to the yeah. webinars. You can download any of the webinars we've done, which we do usually on a monthly basis. Um, as you've noticed, all attendees are muted at this point, and they will continue to be muted for the course of the webinar but we'd ask that you please utilize the question toolbar. You don't have to wait till the end if something comes to mind. Um, I will be monitoring the, uh, the question inbox there and we will get to your questions at the end. Next slide. Okay, so I'd like to, to welcome Henry uh, from Morehouse Instrument Company. Uh, Henry is the president of Morehouse uh, since 2013 and worked at Morehouse for more than 20 years. Uh, Henry has a passion for measurement accuracy and reducing risk associated measurements that impact safety in our day to day lives. Um, there is Henry's contact information, and that will be pulled up again at the end. And I'd like to go ahead and uh, pass this over to Henry. Henry, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. So I've had numerous discussions with Tracy, and I can say that her passion for measurement is fantastic. I'm it, it's a little bit contagious, it rubs off. I love doing this, I love having an audience. So I appreciate everybody's time, it's valuable. The goal is that you've learned something or some takeaways. That being said, we also have a handout and this handout is a full book. Uh, if you have any questions about force calibration, there's uh, a lot of information in there details on chapters, subheadings. I think it's 140 some pages and growing. We add to it every year. That was kind of uh, one of one of my goals is to get something published. In addition to that, there's gonna be some uh, upcoming in the Metrology Handbook, uh, new chapter on force and, and some other things. But that document, I encourage everybody to to uh, go down and uh, and download it. So. This was uh, this webinar is called Improve Your Force Measurements uh, and Tips. Like, like Tracy said, we're going to talk about E74 and some other things. A uh, little bit about us. If you do not know who we are, we're a manufacturing company, have been since 1920. Uh, we produce force and torque calibration equipment uh, adapters. Uh, I like to say we have state-of-the-art force and torque calibration laboratories. I think we do and offer calibrations at a very high level of accuracy, very low uncertainties. This, this right here is the uh, machine. We bought this from NPL, United Kingdom for torque. It's the second most accurate torque machine in the world. Uh, the English taxpayers paid to have it commissioned and then we purchased it uh, later on uh, back in 2010. And then the picture to the left here is our 120,000 pound dead weight that we use in a lot of, adver uh, a lot of advertisements. But really, why do we do things? What gets me up in the morning? Uh, a lot of it is just working with great people and a passion to the measure to know that the measurements we, we make certainly have an outcome. 
Uh, and, and a lot of people don't know what that outcome is sometimes. A lot of employees, maybe they work for you. Maybe they don't know the importance of the measurements we're, we're making. And with force, it's all over the place, uh, right? What if we have a bad measurement? What is the risk that's passed on to the next level? So really wake up with that purpose to create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. And doing webinars and educational things all to to just help help make better measurements. So hopefully uh, some takeaways and outcomes, like to speak about outcomes, uh, what things you be able to do, know the right questions to start asking. I mean, there's a lot of information we're gonna cover today. So if you just take away some of it, right? And know, I need to start asking more questions uh, because it's gonna be very important that I get the right me measurements from my calibration provider, that they replicate how I'm using my equipment, right? Because a lot of times from the calibration side of things, someone sends us something that says, please calibrate, and it's very difficult to get all the ins and outs. And we're gonna talk about those uh, today. Know what constitutes good force measuring equipment, Know the interactions of some adapters used for force calibration and know more about decision risk. Ever since the 2017 uh, ISO IEC 17025 came out, it's been a topic. It was measurement uncertainty for a long time and it still is measurement uncertainty, but now everybody's talking about decision rules. How do you implement these rules? What are they, the sections? You know, we're, we're gonna talk a, a little bit about it. So part of the agenda, uh, ASTM E74 common standard violations. This is the North American standard for the most part. There's ASTM and then the rest of the world. If you're located not in North America and the rest of the world, you may have heard of E74. You might be working to a standard called ISO 376. They are not interchangeable. It's important to note that they are not interchangeable. Then we're gonna talk about asking the right questions, the importance of adapters the right equipment and the right calibration provider for your equipment. Being said, uh, this, uh, I did not talk to PGLA. It's one of the things that I should have done is if there be a copy, we can, I'm assuming we can provide a PDF copy of this presentation if anybody needs it. Um, if not, you can you can ask me. But the other things, we have some additional information. If you go to our website, there's technical papers on adapters, papers on uncertainty propagation. We have papers on ASTM ISO, uh, technical paper on common measurement errors and weighing. Maybe you're weighing PDF version of this presentation. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we have some of these online as well. But that whole section, we also have spreadsheets. We have a ton of content. In fact, yesterday was just creating a, a force to mass spreadsheet. A lot of times people call us up and say, hey, our calibration results don't match yours. And about 80% of the time we find out that they're not using force. They're using mass weights and that's why they don't match. So we created a spreadsheet that'll that'll go up there to help people convert their mass weights to force if they know their air density and material density and all that stuff. So ASTM E74, why it's important. If you're working or know anybody working to any of these, this is not the all all lists, these are the commons. Uh, documents that reference it, there's AASHTO T22, AASHTO T68, ASTM E4. That one is the direct, uh, if you think of ASTM E74 is like the father, E4 is like the, uh, the, the child or mom and child. Uh, then you have ASTM uh, C39, E10, and E18. But this e, e, E4 here, verification of testing machines calls out that says you must have your equipment calibrated in accordance with the E74 standard. If we look at that, we get to a, a pyramid and, and the way E74 works, little outdated, though it works. So this is a term I do not like and it's called test accuracy ratio. I do not like it because it hides a lot uh, of uncertainties. It hides a lot of contributions to uncertainties. It's just basically saying, I have one device that's this accurate. I need to calibrate this other device. If my device is 10 times more accurate, I should be okay. But ASTM was written in around the 1970s, 1974 specific is when it came out, just the coincidence. And it's predicated using this and risk is built into it. It says, if I have primary standards that are known to 0.005%, 
and I calibrate, I can use those and calibrate other standards called secondary standards to 0 0.05. Now I'm building uh, a 10 to one ratio here. And then my secondary standards at 05, I can use these standards to calibrate working standards. This is class AA verified range of forces, class A. ASTM has all these formulas built in. So if you've read the standard, this graphic is basically simplifying what the standard's saying. 10 to one, primary to secondary, secondary to working, five to one, and a testing machine is four to one. Well, I said I didn't like the TAR ratios, ASTM has a, a lot of information in how you follow the standard to perform this work. It reduces the risk tremendously. If you were just using straight TA TARs, they are unsustainable. Meaning if I said I needed a four to one calibration and I work from the bottom up to back to SI units, uh, in some situations, NIST, who does the, the calibration, would may need to be 256 times better uh, than the field measurement. This is very contained. You can see there's only the pyramid has four, four levels, primary, secondary, working, and testing machines. So it works. Uh, does not work when you add six, seven, eight levels is basically what I'm saying. And if we look at the standard and some definitions that are in the standard, primary force standard. It's a dead weight force applied directly without intervening mechanisms such as levers, hydraulic multipliers, or the like, whose mass has been determined by comparison with reference standards, chasable national standards of mass. Yes, we're dealing, it says mass, but we're operating in force. So how do we operate in force? Well, to do that, we have to correct for things. And to correct for things, we correct for local gravity and air buoyancy. And the weights must be adjusted, the standard says, to better than 0.005%. Uh, NIST, our, our great NMI in this country, the United States, has their weights adjusted to within five parts per million. Morehouse, who we use NIST for most of our calibrations, when we do our uncertainties, we're about four times higher at 20 parts per million. Very, very low uh, overall. And then uh, the ASTM standard says weight shall be made of rolled forge or cast metal. Adjustment cavities should be closed by threaded plates. So we take the target mass that we get from calibrating our density and gravity and air buoyancy. All of that stuff, uh, we get a target mass to generate a force. And force is mass times acceleration. Force is force everywhere in the world. So if I calibrate a load cell today for somebody that's out there listening and they use that load cell, in a different part of the country, it's still force. If I calibrated it in mass now and you used it somewhere else, now there's a gravity differential, right? Because I didn't adjust for all of these things. So there you get a pretty large, you can get some pretty large errors when you're comparing mass to mass, but force is force anywhere in the world. A secondary standard as defined by ASTM E74, here's examples. This is a really cool machine. This is a lever machine off, uh, here. Uh, GTM, GMBH, GTM uh, make these types of machines. They're in a lot of NMIs. We make dead weight machines that are in a lot of NMIs. These are about, these are accurate for the most part. Uh, the uncertainties are about 0.01 or better consistently through the range. They're used a lot for the ISO uh, 376 type of uh, calibrations. But anyway, uh, really cool machine if you've not seen the. Uh, the lever machines. But a secondary force standard is an instrument or mechanism, the calibration of which has been established by comparison with primary. Back to that pyramid that I showed. In order to perform calibrations in accordance with E74, your force standard must be calibrated with primary standards. Talking a little bit about it, those that aren't interested in E74, that's fine, we'll get into other things. But this is a legal standard. So a lot of people say, I need a calibration, right? And what does that mean? Does it mean you need 10 points, five points, upscale, downscale, ascending, descending measurements? It's, it's the definition. There's really not that many calibration procedures for force besides ISO 376, ASTM, and, and some others. Uh, they often fall under this commercial calibration, what a lot of people do. 
And what a lot of people do is they give you this calibration that has five or 10 points. They do not rotate the instrument, which they never test the, you know, the repeatability condition or reproducibility condition of the measurement. They do all this, they don't do anything and they give you numbers. You go to use that, that load cell and who knows how good it is. What ASTM does and does a very good job of, I like to say, is the things I'm gonna talk about give you an expected performance of that load cell or force instrument when used under similar conditions. Very important, because if you change things out, hardness, which we'll talk about of adapters, you change out the equipment, all things can change. But by doing this prescribed procedure, we are really shipping out an instrument that is that where you know how good this instrument should be. You still have to do other uncertainty contributors. Um, but for the most part, this procedure tends to be the lion's share of the uncertainty. And why? It's because we put at least 30 force applications are required. And here at Morehouse, we typically re recommend three runs of 11 or 33, and I'll get to why. There should be at least one calibration force for each 10% interval throughout the loading range. And if the instrument is to be used below 10% of capacity, a low force should be used. And that is why we say 11. Because if you just do, if you have a 100,000 pound load cell, 10% increments is 10,000 pounds. How do you know how good that load cell is below 10,000 pounds if you haven't tested it? And some people can say zero can be a force. It cannot be. The standard is very clear. This force must be greater than the resolution of the device multiplied by 400 for class A and 2000. Basically the standard says you have the resolution that your first test point has to be either multiplied by 400 times the resolution or 2000 for uh, working standard, secondary standard. Procedure, ASTM, look, someone sends us something, we're gonna check it in, we're gonna allow it to come to room temperature, usually 24 hours. We're gonna warm up instrumentation, 20 to 30 minutes. We usually start around 20 minutes, do some exercise cycles and everything else. We're gonna select that 10 to 11 test points, 11 preferred. We're gonna fixture our UUT in the test frame, exercise it at least, it required is two. A lot of times we'll do about four or five exercise cycles to really get, get all the molecules in the, uh, in the load cell or the force measuring device happy and excited. This helps with some zero returns and helps with some other things. So then we apply uh, the first series of forces and that's over here, that's this run one. And we record the readings. We apply a second series of forces. We rotate the device 120 degrees record readings, rotate it another 120 degrees. Really, we're randomizing the loading condition. That's if this is just you know compression only. If it's tension, uh, we'll do two runs of compression, run three runs of tension, and then switch back to compression. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what this is saying. And with, you take all these numbers, and the way ASTM works is you determine something called the lower limit factor, the LLF. And that is based on taking the standard deviation of all the, you know, you do a curve fit equation, uh, curve fit the force to the millivolts or whatever you're reading in, do an equation, take the differences of all those numbers, minus N minus M minus one. So those that, those that are heavy in statistics, this is weird. This is, they build in some extra conservative um, numbers in here because it's usually N minus one. Uh, but the degree fit comes in as a little bit of a penalty with that M. But we're going to do all of this. This gives us the standard deviation, and then we're going to multiply it by 2.4, uh, and that gives us our lower limit factor. And that's roughly 98, around 98.2% uh, confidence. And the criteria is based on LLF or resolution. If I have what that, what this is saying is if I have a 100,000 pound load cell and my resolution is 100 pounds, yeah, I'm probably not gonna show, that is very, very coarse resolution. I'm probably not gonna show any differences. So we're gonna, we're gonna take that 100 pound resolution and we're gonna use that as our, as our limiting factor. So penalty for those that wanna cheat and set their instruments to be perfectly repeatable. 
Any force measuring instrument that is either modified or repaired should be recalibrated. That's what they say in the standard. And if you monitor your zero balance, this is that 1% uh, shift should be calibrated again. Some common violations that we see happening all the time or things that people ask us for, 1121 is basically recalibration criteria. And it, it says uh, that for class AA, needs to be better than 0 0.032 and for class A better than 0.16. The maximum stability is two years. The standard is very clear that you could set an interval in accordance with the standard and if everything passes, if all my points pass, I compare this calibration versus last and all of them are better than 0 0.032, I can set a two year calibration interval. Then the standard says, hey, uh, force measurements not meeting the stability criteria shall be calibrated at intervals that shall ensure. So this is where it gets a little gray. So if I don't meet all that criteria, now I need to shorten it to ensure it meets. That could be down to 18 months. It could be 16 months. It could be as low as one day, depending on the instrumentation and variability and everything that you have. It's so important to buy good equipment and know what you're getting. Another violation there uh, is is the two percent uh, that uh, seven point two point one. If the lower force limit of the verified range of forces is anticipated to be less than one tenth of the maximum force applied during calibration, then forces should be applied at or below this. And that's what I talked about earlier on the resolution. So they're basically saying the should is a weasel word. word. Uh, however, it's there is a shall, and the shall is 400 times the resolution and 2,000 times the resolution. So, and there's more, more documentation. So here's what happens. I think this is a lot easier to show a picture of what's wrong here. I have a test report, and my first force, po my first non-zero force point is 500. My class A lower limit is 192.3. This is technically in violation of the standard. And why is it in violation? It's because the verified range of forces, here's my shall, shall not include forces outside the range of forces applied during the calibration. So zero is not a, is not a calibrated force, and there that is. And if we look at the, the direct sections 8.6.2, says the verified range of forces shall not include forces outside the range applied, and this wording, in no case should the smallest force applied be below the lower force limit of force as defined by 400 times the resolution and 2,000 times the resolution. And then someone that's really keen on standards, this is written very poorly and will be switched within the next uh, edition of E74, or at least I hope it is. In no case should, uh, horrible grammar there, in no case shall or a shall or in no case uh, the should words are bad in all standards and all we know, but it, it's preceded by in no case. So that's an interesting one to have a ruling on. So secondary force standard, that's the one that's calibrated with primary. Here's a here's another, if you try to see what's going on here, uh, what's based on things. I think I can blow this up. What this person did here is they assigned a class AA loading range and they use the load cell. And the standard, it's fine, load cells are good, but the standard basically says, hey, to get a class AA verified range of forces, you need to have it calibrated with primary. That's back to that 10 to one, the five to one. So I need the 10 to one, and a load cell cannot assign another, a uh, secondary standard cannot assign another class AA. This is where the standard gets broken and a large risk starts getting passed on because there were four tiers of this of the pyramid. This company here is adding another tier by perpetually assigning class AA verified range of forces. So that's what that's saying. Uh, another example uh, I've seen, uh, really interesting example on this one that we have calibrated against this load cell, traceable to NIST, uh, all, re all readings were plus or minus 0 0.01. Uh, applied load was this or this, whichever is greater. Load cell was due 
their their standards do now. Accuracy of the load solos are maintained to be better than okay. They're just they just pulled that out of ASTM. It's not true. These accuracies are determined by direct comparison to basic standards certified by Morehouse. Our name made the cert. We do not do business with this company, but our name our name made the cert. Traceable to NIST per blah 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 blah. So many things are wrong. And then here they go. It's 2000. You can see 2018 between 2018 and 19, and they're referencing E7402, uh, a document that's now in 18. And before 18, there was 13, and before 13, there was six. So we're probably at least four revisions down. Um, this company, and then I went like I always do, uh, and I looked up their scope. Guess what? Their scope says they're uh, 0.037 for the range use, but yet they're saying they're better than 025. Just really misleading, confusing, troubling documentation where uh, someone that knows metrology or or someone like Perry Johnson, one of the assessors should go in and th th those are some, some strong deficiencies there when they uh, have something on their cert uh, that's a lot lower than what their uh, capability really is. And anyway, so the uh, ASTM is not ISO 376. As I said, the, the rest of the world, a lot of the world uses E74, but a lot of them also use ISO 376. ISO 7500, if you're one of the assessors out there or somebody doing calibrations with ISO 7500, you need to have your standard calibrated in accordance with ISO 376. You cannot use the ASTM E74 calibration to perform uh, an ISO 7500 calibration. The standards are vastly different. E74 has three runs, ISO tests for a lot more. Backwards, they are backwards compatible. When I say that, if you do an ISO 376 calibration, there's typically enough information to run an E74 report. But on the E74 side, there is not enough information. ISO requires at least four runs of data. ASTM is only three. ISO does a lot more testing, creep tests, not an E74, and a lot of other things. So ASTM, if I look at ASTM, does this really well. It determines reproducibility. ISO does repeatability without rotating. It does interpolation error. It does reversibility or creep. Uh, there's a zero test. And then it, it gives guidance. ASTM has its own pyramid, and ISO gives its own guidance to classify a, a device. If we got into starting to do uncertainties or look at uncertainties for uh, calibrations, we have a whole document here. I just uh, typically I see people doing this wrong a lot. If you have uncertainty or doing your uncertainties, what I see happening is people take the load cell spec sheet or they have somebody come in, they take the load cell spec sheet, and then they put all these numbers down under, under uncertainty and they ignore this. Number one, how how the device was calibrated. Guess what? This trumps this, this, and even this because you're calibrating the device to a standard which is giving you the expected performance. Therefore, we can throw away our specifications for the most part on these, these three specifications. But if we're gonna do an uncertainty, typically we're gonna do with E74 or type A's, uh, that's by statistical analysis for the little refresher, uh, the quick one. Uh, type A's typically include the ASTM lower limit factor, repeatability of the best existing device, repeatability and reproducibility. Then we get into type B, or for sake of time, uh, means other than statistical analysis, like resolution. So type Bs would be resolution of our best existing device, reference standard resolution if applicable. I have if applicable here because if you're in force, if you're using dead weight, dead weight does not have a resolution. It's uh, it's just a solid chunk of object. Reference standard uncertainty, reference standard stability, environmental factors, and then this is the catch-all, other error sources. So we could write these forever, and I'll talk about more of these other error sources. Though, again, back to the website, this is a free-to-download. 
a lot of our stuff is free to download. Like I said, we just want to help everybody make better measurements. And we have a whole uncertainty guide that says type this in here, this here, walks you through it, instructions. This is a quick summation sheet of a two-point cow. I would I would do more on the range than two-point. This is one that we typically do in class. Uh, it's one of our PCMs. And you can see uh, the 10% range, 100% range, if this was a 2,000-pound two, uh, load cell, Look at this, people like to use one number for uncertainty, but if you look at a, the load cell, and this typically follows with all load cells, is the closer you get to zero, the higher the uncertainty, because you have con contributing factors such as resolution and stability and a lot of other things uh, that make their way into these equations. But when we got to capacity, we were at 005%, 00551%. So, uh, a lot different. I, I typically say for force devices, a general rule of thumb is 20% to 100% of capacity if they're a reference standard uh, can get you some very, very good numbers of better than 0.2% uh, percent of applied. Asking the right questions. Uh, are you discussing customer requirements? Uh, what type of calibration is needed? So some examples, capacity, I would hope anybody quoting uh, says, hey, what size is this thing? You know, is it 100,000, 10,000? Modes, compression, tension, what standard? ASTM, like I said, ISO, those are written, documented legal standards. Then we get into these, commercial calibration, five-point calibration. What are, the, what are the reporting expectations if you're doing something like this? Do you want to know the SEB, which is static error band? Do you want to know nonlinearity, hysteresis? What's that going to do for you? How is that going to help you? Uh, tolerance required and decision rules. I attended A to LA's um, deficiency. That was one of their tops. Perry Johnson probably has their own uh, tops. Um, all uh, I think all of the ABs basically see the commercial laboratories operate almost in the same manner where they have uh, a lot of different uh, things. And right now, the decision rule is probably one of the bigger ones that people are getting deficiencies for. Does the calibration uh, require ascending, descending points? Uh, do you have a calibration due date or frequency you want to be put on a certificate? If in accordance with the standard, can we assign a due date? You know, uh, is the customer responsible? Uh, so, yes, very important here. I see labs violate that. We will not assign a due date unless someone says, hey, assign it to the standard and the standard is clear. Otherwise, Customer has to tell us. I mean, I can we can give guidance all day long by saying based on similar instrumentation and the ability to hold, uh, we recommend maybe you try 18 months and if it works for you, then you can shorten it from there. Or maybe we recommend 10 days, right? That it's just that bad and functioning that poorly that it should be replaced. How is the instrument currently being used? This is a really important question and it doesn't get uh, does not get ask enough. Uh, our job as Calibration House is to replicate how you would be using that device. If we change a lot of those criteria, we'll get, we're going to get some different numbers and then any additional requests. That's just a basic guideline. So some of the things that we get that we see problematic are ascending, descending points. A lot of times we have people that are just getting one measurement ascending which would be this bottom curve right here, this, this orange curve. And then they use it to make both ascending and descending measurements. So it's problematic because we haven't, if we haven't calibrated it, how do we know what way it's gonna behave? It's certainly not gonna behave the same way it did in ascending. And ASCM addresses this and says, if they're used under increasing forces, but if a force measuring is to be used under, de it shall be calibrated under decreasing. And then we go on. I, I get, I nerd out sometimes. I've been in the lab. As Tracy mentioned, 20 plus years. I've been doing this for a lot longer than that. But I was at Caltech for at least 15. Uh, I shared the, in 2013 was probably, 2013 to 15 was probably the hardest years where I was actually president of the company, also in the Cal Lab a lot and doing almost everything and, and working ridiculous hours. The working ridiculous hours hasn't changed, but doing a lot less. Um, and I like to look at all this data. But back then I would take this data and I would look at it. So 
uh, take a very good 100K load cell. Output negative 2.0304 on the ascending curve and then compare it against the descending curve and then you had a difference of 0.042%. Now, some people may say that that's pretty low error. That might not matter. might not matter for your application. If it's a reference standard calibrating other load cells, it does matter because zero point, if back to that secondary standard needs to be better than 0.05, that's 80, eating up 84% of the total error. Uh, not good at all, uh, not recommended. More right questions, how is the instrument being used? This is my favorite. A lot of scenarios, uh, a lot of things to ask. What adapters are used with it? How is it loaded? Common questions might be if the force device is loaded through the top shoulder or thread loaded. If thread loaded, how much engagement? This, we lost hours this past week. We could not believe it. One of, one of our customers, which we try to educate, took out the adapter of the load cell. They take it out and then we get into it and they said, we're off by about 0.3%. Okay, you're off by 0.3, force to mass, as I said, the gravity. Are you using mass weights? No. All right. Well, what's going on here? Well, I took it to my other force lab, and they're showing that, yeah, we're 0.3% different from you. Okay. So he's like, he's back. He's forming the opinion that Morehouse is wrong. And I typically say we're guilty until proven innocent, because that's what you get at when you get in these measurement challenge. And then we started asking questions. And they said, well, how, what's happening here? And through the, answering questions, we discovered that they were engaging the load cell 1.1 inches of threaded engagement. In our lab, we engaged the load cell 10 threads on a 5 8 18 thread. So we engaged it about 0.625 inches. People are saying 0.625 versus 1.1. When we went back to him and we said, hey, understand you're threading an adapter the whole way into it, and we're matching the whole size. If you could turn that down th 10 threads and make another measurement, could you do that for us? And the, the guy went around and said, yeah, I can do that. And he did it. And now we were within like point, it was 0.3. And now we were within like 0.005%. So huge difference. And at 005, you can chase a lot of things. So, you know, super large error, very acceptable error that we, we further worked with them and we have a good plan in place. When I talk about that, that was one example and I didn't have clear pictures. This one I have clear pictures on, different hardness. So over here, you see this, this load cell. Customer sends this in without their adapters. We do a calibration with our adapters and the results don't match. So then the customer sends in their adapters and me having the cell there, I started doing tests. I did tests for like a week straight. And what we did was use their adapters. That's this uh, hardened top lock. And then we used ours 4340 top lock. And I did tests different days, everything else. But if we look at it, just these two pictures with our adapter, right here and with their hardened adapter look at these differences this is 10 per, this is 10 percent of capacity this is 600,000 pound load so this is so this is about 60,000 this is uh 300,000 this is 600 look at the difference in adapters someone may say why does that happen well here if you look at this you look at the strain gauge is placed all load cells have strain gauges they measure the, the actual strain that's on this when we push on it, this material deflects and we measure this. So 2%, if we model this, 2% different in strain at the gauge between the hard and soft loading block. Materials with different hardness experience different amounts of lateral deflection under the same amount of load. Therefore, the varying hardness causes different amounts of stress between the block and load cell. The above analysis shows steel to steel it gets much worse if we use softer material. So even steel to steel, that 4340 versus the hardened block, we had a 0.3% difference. You're gonna have it, right? So this is why it's so critical 
to marry your load cell with the appropriate top adapters. That's why this picture exists. If somebody buys a load cell from us, we're gonna say, and we're gonna try our hardest to marry a top adapter to it. And then that comes with it for calibration, that's used with it in practice. And then these errors completely go away because they are errors resulting from that difference in the hardness. This one will make a little more sense because it was back to where I was talking about this is, is the force device loaded through the top shoulder or thread loaded? If thread loaded, how much engagement? That's what I was talking about earlier with that 0 0.3 to 0 0.005. But here's a, here's a picture. So we loaded this, customer sends it in, says, just load it and tell me what you did. Okay. So I took two different adapters, these two shown. I loaded it. I got with an inch and a half engagement, I got uh, 10,001.5 as output. And with a half inch engagement, I got 9942.3. There was a difference of 59.2 pounds on a 10,000 pound load cell, error of 0.5% on a device expected to be better than 025. Simple math, 025, 05, 20 times what was expected. Unacceptable. All goes away if the customer sends their adapter and tells us, Thread it in against the shoulder or thread it in and back it off a quarter turn. This is this is more the situation. People love to use these load cells. Certain manufacturers show them with this hole. This cell is no good with this hole in it because that thread depth is going to change the output. If you lock an adapter into place, or you use one of these bottom adapters and consistently use it with the load cell, now the load cell is awesome. I would rec highly recommend it. I would not highly recommend this in any shape form. When you lock the integral adapter in, it becomes repeatable. The numbers are great. You're not gonna have the variation with thread, the different strains and stresses exerted upon it. It highly repeatable, reproducible. The load cell is awesome. Yank this adapter out, not worth much. I can honestly tell you, I'm not a fan. And again, unless you consistently use, have a prescribed process where you say, hey, I'm gonna use this adapter, I'm gonna thread it in hand tight. Then it's then we'll repeat within 0.01% all day long. Uh, but again, this very low error, much lower than 01. This is, this, is, this is your best scenario right here, best B. Uh, this is next best is to lock the adapter. Errors start getting high. This is like an 01 or better error. And then here you have this, which can go up to 0.3 and other things, which is who wants that. You're paying a lot of money for calibration. Why would you want something that can vary by as much as 0.3% on something you expect to be 025? Here's something that's interesting, not a large error by any means, but we ask, is it loaded through the bottom threads? Generally, if somebody sends something to us, we're gonna load it this way, right? Flat on the bottom. However, we need to know if you're loading it this way, because there's a difference. And on a reference standard, the difference is about 0.12% from these numbers, three pounds at 25,000. Not a huge source, but a, an error we wanna eliminate. So if we know you're gonna load it through the bottom threads, we do this. Our competitors consistently do this, and what we find is the competitors consistently do this, but the users typically use it like this. So off the start, from, from if they're the ones doing your reference cal, from the start, you're gonna be off by about 0.012 if you're loading it flat. So very important to figure out how they're loading it and make sure they're replicating. You need to be your best advocate because there's so many people in the world, so many salespeople, and if you don't know, not all of them are asking. And we do our best here. Uh, it's not as good as I want it to be, uh, but we are capturing the law of Pareto. We are doing, getting those 20% that, that yield 80% of the important results. There's probably 50 or more questions we'd have to inundate people with. And that's a very difficult scenario because you also want to make, you want to be friendly and you want to accommodate. Um, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Like I said, there's about 10 really, really important questions here. And then the rest are nice to have if, if somebody, if you're not bothering somebody and you can get 
get more information from them. Importance of adapters, keeping the line of force pure, free from eccentric forces, key to calibration of load cells. ASTM E74 does not address the various, but ISO 376 does. I like this standard a lot in this annex. Uh, I recommend it. I think it's like $80, $90 to go purchase the standard because it is controlled. Uh, I highly recommend anyone read it in the annex, if, especially if, you, if you're into designing your own adapters. Tension lengths uh, versus proper pin diameter. Oh boy, this comes across a lot, at least uh, at first it came, we've educated most of our customers. There's still some that it comes across just the other uh, last week, it came across yet again, where manufacturers specs something at 0.1% and they weren't getting it. And you go through the pin size, everything else, uh, uh, their spec is is pretty, is not conservative. Uh, that's another thing to, to learn as you go with this. When someone says, hey, accuracy is 0.1%, and then you go back to the manufacturer and you start saying, hey, uh, I'm not getting that. And the manufacturer comes back and says, hey, that's under ideal conditions. Guess what? But this one is not even ideal conditions. This one is, hey, we got two different pin sizes here and large versus small pin these two pictures i can tell you this pin is two inches this one is about 175 if i recollect correctly 175 inches and the difference was 860 pounds on a 0.1 percent device which is yielded 1.72 percent error it would be very, very easy for a lab to use this 175 inch pin, adjust all the tense, tension links that come into their lab. And then the customer goes and uses a shackle type pin dynamometer that's 1.97 or two inches and be out by 1.72%. This could be a critical application. This could be weighing, right? A cargo container. What if you were off by you know almost 2% on everything you weighed? I want to find that if somebody's shipping raw materials, there's a lot of money to be made there. If you think about it, if they're off by this much, we could take the the excess and sell it uh, if if it goes that way. If it's going the other way, boy, you're, you're getting a lot less than what you paid for. So the note on this is I have yet to find one that doesn't behave the, this way, but tension links of this design all seem to exhibit similar problems, but Anyone can test it. If you're unsure, test it. You have different adapters, make sure you're safe, test it. That leads us to proper adapters. Here's our UCM. What we ended up doing is I we applied for a patent for this system that basically said, hey, I have a cow machine. I need, manufacturers have pin sizes galore. So we made one set of clevises and, and then a bunch of pins. Uh, and what that ends up happening for the Cal Lab is almost anything that walks in the door, you have the pin size to calibrate it. And here's an example. If we look at this sheet, what we're talking about here is this diam this pin size right here, E, the shackle pin diameter. So in E here, it says, hey, if I got a 20 ton device, I need a two inch pin, a 50 ton, 2.75. If we look at that, there's things, if you look at this whole sheet uh, on this other side, 25 ton, 25 ton takes a 197, 20 ton takes a two inch. Look, that's just 50 millimeter. But even that difference from two inch to 197 could be a counter to. It's usually not the 0.1%, but it's not uncommon for it to be, you know, 0 .0, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, somewhere in there, 0.02. It's not uncommon to change that and have enough to put a device in or out of tolerance. So we are very particular in our pin sizes. If it calls for 197, we use 197. If it calls for two, we use two. Best practice is to use what the customer sends in with it, but if they don't send it in, we're going to the spec sheet. But in load cell, here's one people, one lab might just say, okay, I'm gonna use this method, sandwich it between two plates. What's interesting about this is I did a rotational test. This is me, average 2008. And then I did the same thing where I aligned it. I got better fixturing and alignment and my average was 2008. 
right? Interesting. Same result, almost. But when we look at this, when we look at the error between the deviations, one is depending on what position and whatever, I had an error of 1.045. And then the second one, when I used better adapters with better alignment, better centering, all that fun stuff, my error was 0.19. Now, a lot of the customers want this device. They'll say, hey, I want you to calibrate this and I want you to calibrate it and I want it to be better than 0.5% because I looked at the load cell specification sheet and that's what it says it should be. At which point I say, not possible. It's just, you're not gonna get it with this type of load cell. We have a technical paper on adapters. One of my highlights in 2018 at NCSLI. If you're not part of NCSLI, it's a great organization. Uh, you'll see various uh, labs there, uh, various other labs. Uh, and various accreditation bodies are there. So we have that technical paper on adapters. And we're gonna get into equipment. So if you're designing force equipment or you just want better equipment, the right equipment's gonna be, I, I say five things, right? Plumb level, square, rigid, and free of torsion. Well, you're never gonna get perfect on any of this. Torsion exists, you have two threads you're trying to thread into something and then you're trying to pull them. The natural tendency is there is a slope to those threads. There's a steepness and the natural tendency is they want to unwind. They don't, though they want to. So torsion is an interesting and all of these make good machine, good machines. And we'll just go over them rather quick. Is plumb exactly vertical or true? There we have a dead weight machine. Uh, if the weights have to hang in a vertical direction, if they are out of plumb, they will introduce misalignment. What's interesting uh, with it, these machines, one time I had uh, someone in our shop, they said, hey, it's ready for testing. So I go and test the machine. I get rather large deviations and I go, hey, you told me it was ready for testing. I just have a question. Did you level that? And he looked over his notes and, and then he said, nope, didn't do that yet. So levels the machine. And when I do my final test, I got a magnitude of about five times better than when it was out of level. So, you know, very, really important to get that. What we do is we get the machinist level on that and make sure make sure everything's right. Uh, is level, speaking of level on both machines, uh, device for establishing a horizontal line or plane by means of a bubble and liquid uh, that shows adjustment to horizontal by movement of a slightly bowed glass tube. Look, you can buy digital levels. Uh, the machinist level is just fantastic. Digital levels work. There's a 100K UCM. The feet down here are all adjustable, so we can adjust this to be level. Square, for four machines, they're having four right angles. If you look at this, this is our BCM machine. Right angles in place, uh, adjustable beam forms for right angle, just really good practice uh, there and, and helps with some of the rigidity. Rigid, this has plates galore underneath here. They're all welded, this base. The deflection is so minimal in, in this new machine, this USC 60K, but that, all we're saying is not flexible. If you start seeing this bow as you apply force, not too good, right? So we want that to be as rigid as possible. Torsion, my favorite, uh, the act of twisting or state of being twisted, free from torsion means free of being twisted when forces are applied. We did a lot up here. Uh, we have all kinds of adapters. Uh, we have bearings, all kinds of things. And before we put the bearings in this, the measurement errors were higher when we tested two load cells and dead weight, that's called dissemination testing, were higher than 0.1%. Probably not good for many people that want a reference machine. So then we added bearings. We did a lot of other things. I simplified it just to bearings. And the error be became less than 0.02 .02 when comparing. So right now, most people say, hey, what, how good is this machine? It's usually 0.02 to 0.03. If you put a, get a proficiency test cell in, uh, do an ILC, compare two load cells with dead weight, you'll usually get around 015, 02, and you can pass your proficiency test with, with that. Uh, right equipment, like to say replicates field juice. Uh, so yeah, just depending on what's going on, this, is, this, this machine here is more dynamic. 
the timing. It's not dwelling on the force points versus this one's more controlled and that is dwelling on the force points. The technician's actually holding it. We have an automated version that you know, can hold the weight, but you're taking the readings, you're programming in 10 seconds, whatever, uh, traceability back to static, more like static as opposed to dynamic. There's a lot of different uh, ideas opposed to that. But, you know, replicates field use. Here's one of our machines elsewhere. Here's the NIST machine. The second one here is the NIST million pound machine and how it operates, it's huge. Uh, again, just showing how people are positioning. Different different compression and tension spaces where this one does, you know, both, basically does both compression and tension in the same setup. If we look at NMI such as NIST, different compression tension, different compression tension, there's a GTM machine, different tension compression, this one's a, this is actually an interesting machine right here because you can have your tension area down there. So, you know, if we look at replicates field use, the calibration laboratory should not perform compression and tension in the same setup uh, unless that's how the device is being used. If it's being used, then perform it, perform calibration in the same setup. They should use the customer's top blocks and make separate compression setups. Uh, in compression, they should require a base plate to load against. For tension calibration, the end users calibrating per ISO 7500, they should use adapters recommended in the annex, which would be different than what is shown here. So just some things to consider. Now we talk about calibration provider has low enough uncertainties to meet your need. Uh, and we get into ISO IEC 17025-2017-37. Decision rule as a rule that describes how measurement uncertainty is accounted for when stating conformity with a specified requirement. You start looking at this, here's really, TUR when calculated properly, this is going to shock some of you. If we go into ILAC P14, uh, section 5.4, we can get a de pretty good definition of TUR, but ANSI, NC, ANSI NCSLI Z540.3 handbook has the full definition, which says, hey, the denominator is this and this. Uh, ILAC P14, section 5.4 talks about using the same contributors that were used to establish your CMC. Uh, in any case, we can boil it down to, this is the reference standard uncertainty, this is the resolution of the UT, these are your repeatability studies, and we add this for TUR in case you know that you have other errors. But if we use this same formula and compare primary versus secondary standards, TUR on this device, 22 to one, TUR using secondary one to one. If we look at this graphically, looking at the measured location, here we're perfect. 10,000 10, pounds and 10,000 supplied. Look at this. Risk already, when we use this equation and calculate measurement uncertainty correctly, in this scenario, we already have risk of 4.55%. In fact, I have to laugh. I dealt with this this morning. It's funny how these things happen. Someone said, I need to get equipment to give me a four to one TUR. And the resolution of their device is a 10,000 pound load cell and the resolution of their device is one pound. There's no way, if we took away everything else to this formula, if we go back one, and all we put in is resolution of one pound, divided by the square root of 12 and run this through, the best TUR you could possibly get was 0 0.87 to one. So resolution definitely plays a role in this scenario. So what, what do you think happens? Our risk is 4.55, one scenario is zero. If, if we wanna make a conformity assessment, can this lab even pass this instrument with a total risk of 4.55? And if we move it, we're still within the specification. The accuracy specification of this might be plus or minus 10 pounds, right? And this, in this scenario, I have it plus or minus five pounds. So plus or minus five pounds accuracy specification, look, it's way out, right? But it's still in the acceptance limits if we don't consider the measurement uncertainty. That's why the standard's so big on measurement uncertainty and considering the measurement uncertainty. Our, my risk, if I send this to Calibration or us or wherever, they're basically sending this back to you, saying it pa might be saying it's passing if they didn't consider the measurement uncertainty. They might say it passes the acceptance criteria. 
However, they're giving you they're giving you 34.47% risk. Too much, in my opinion. Really, uh, this is, comes from ILAC G8, uh, a great document. They're all available. All the ILAC documents, for the most part, are free. I don't know if any charge. I don't think any do. I, ILAC P14, ILAC G8. I like ILAC G8 a lot. Uh, ILAC G8 2009, the old version. I like a little bit better than the new version, but uh, they're both very good documents. But this says... Look, acceptance interval. If I have a small uncertainty, I have more room to pass an instrument. So if I go to a lab with a very small uncertainty, the chances of them telling me my device is good has increased drastically from that lab with the larger uncertainty. That's all this is showing graphically. Nice, nice little takeaway to say uncertainties matter. Here's why. There's a lot more in that. And uh than just that. And then the right calibration provider, hopefully by now, replicates how the instrument is being used, uh, uses the right adapters, competent technicians with training, training records, follows published standards, reports measurement uncertainty correctly. Another thing, highly rated for on-time delivery. This one we see a lot of, a uh, lot of complaints. I, I'll brag about us a little bit. We're seven to 10 days. We, always have been that is our goal when something gets sent in it's seven to ten days we're hearing a lot of three months six months i don't understand why um it's 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 what it is uh that doesn't mean things don't sit here longer than seven to ten days at times if everything's working it's seven to ten days if you send in a broken instrument that needs repair uh then we might need to order parts or whatnot but for the most part if the equipment is working fine today and it's sent in here Seven to 10 days, reasonable, and that should be 100% of the time if it's working. Uh, and then ask the right questions to help their customers make better force measurements. So we have four standards, so 002. A lot of the testing I showed, not detectable if you're at 05 or some of the other ones, like loading through top and bottom thread. Um, we can conduct a lot of tests. I've conducted a lot of them. You know, the frightening part is not everybody in industry realizes they have these errors. And maybe some of you are sitting there and you're like, wow, we never thought about that. We never thought about sending a top block. Hey, today you can change, or the people watching this, you can change. Start sending a top block. You're using one. How are you using your device without a top block? Thread. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let people know how you're threading it. Let them know. I mean, can you imagine make a company making critical measurements on using a machine that's not plumb level, square, rigid, free of torsion? What if they just welded some stuff up and it's not even straight? I mean, can you imagine that I tomorrow I start saying, hey, I'm going to calibrate gauge blocks. I got this great tape measure at, at Lowe's. I'm going to start doing it. It's there's That stuff is happening. Maybe not for a lot of the labs, but it is happening and some of the labs are doing it. Um, so how about weighing something like a ton of uranium with the wrong pin size? If we want a nuclear waste and we're and specifications 0.1% and we're actually out by 17.2 times that, uh, all these measurements, they matter and they can be significant. So I always ask, please join us in educating the people who underestimate the importance of following the standards, asking the right questions, using the proper machines and adapters. Uh, hopefully there's some takeaways and you all can start uh, help us helping us to create a safer world. Because it's your lives, it's your friends' lives. The next time somebody goes on that airplane, the next time they cross a bridge, if someone does something stupid and equipment fails, it can be avoided. There's the, the department collapse in Miami, there's the bridge stuff, there's the, the, the pins on the crane collapses, if you remember in Seattle, there's the BP oil explosion. They just didn't, about Texas refinery explosion. They the the level indicated that it was um, falling when it was actually rising. It, it's traced back uh, over two billion dollar mistake is traced back to a, a 1975 calibration certificate. It's crazy stuff. There's brain labs. Uh, you can look up the uh, what else is there. There's uh, rivers that drain because someone misdrilled and miscalculated it. They Lots of uh, Lake Pen Penua or whatever. So, yeah, now we're going into time for questions and answers. 
do not worry, you do not need this. This is that free handout that's here, also sold on Am Amazon, but we're send we're giving you a free PDF if you wanna learn more. Uh, I need to get better mouse skills because I'm going over. But now we have, uh, hopefully we're back to Tracy and we have time for uh, some Q&A. Besides the Q&A, uh, some logistics here. Uh, next webinar is April 29th. Really good one, it seems that's like coming up. Requirements concerning documents control and the control of records. Like that, like that topic. So people book their calendars for the next PGLA webinar there. And we have contact information that people, as I'm answering questions, which I hope you have some, I'd love to answer them. Uh, so that being said, time for Q&A. And there's information for Tracy and PGLA, and there's information for Morehouse, if there are any questions. Great, thank you, Henry. That was a great presentation. A lot of information there. Um, one of the questions we did have that I will answer um, is yes, this, part, this uh, presentation will be available uh, on our website for download, as well as the recording. Okay, so we do have a few questions, Henry. Um, okay. Let me go ahead and get started for you. Yes, um, no, yes. Can you, <laughs> can you recommend any reference standard for verifying force measurement unit, which is working by converting pressure values using a chart from piston? I mean, let me start over again. I'm sorry, I, I'm having a hard time expanding my, <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. Just a second. Oh, I'm having trouble with my question bar. Please. I think I got some of it as you were saying. So force piston, uh, a reference standard, uh, and I can kind of go at the question. Uh, we deal with this somewhat. So if somebody has a pressure system, Typically what the recommendation is, is use a calibrating machine, a load cell or stand. Our, we do this all the time in our lab, so I'll just using our frames. What we typically do is we set up that reference pressure standard in the bottom of the machine, and then we run that device. So if we wanna calibrate that device at, I'm just gonna use arbitrary numbers, like in increments of 100 PSI up to 1000 PSI. So we just run that device to 100 PSI, and then we read the reference load cell on our, our frame and say at 100 PSI, the actual force applied was 5,020. Then we run it to 200 PSI, and the actual force applied at 200 PSI was 10,060. Not 100% linear, and I'm doing that on purpose. Then you run it to 300, and 300 is 15, uh, maybe it's 15,100. And then we just put a, you can do um, so many things with that. You can do a slope line if you just want to do that. You can do uh, coefficients. We have um, in the Excel session section of our website, we have a coefficient generated where you can put in 12 readings and it can generate higher order fits. That's free to download too. So you can do it that way. Uh, that's the way we recommend doing it. That's the way I know how to do it. I'm sure there's other ways to do it. Hopefully that answers the question uh, that I think was being asked. The problem is we're, I'm making an ex a assumption, which if I get it wrong, that's that's bad. If I get it right, I'm a hero. Um, or, or So hopefully I got it right. And hopefully that answered that question is to run the pressure system in a frame and then read in the appropriate frame and then read the reference use that as the control and dial that into the psi values or whatever you're reading and then read the actual force off the uh, load cell system or read the millivolts and convert to force off the load cell system whatever works Okay, next question. Can you use these load cells for Rockwell hardness? We do use them for Brunel, just unsure if applicable for the Rockwell testers. Great question. Brunel, you can, you need a special adapter uh, for Brunel. Those load cells, typically we make adapters that go on with for a 10 millimeter ball seat. The, I believe the same would be 
true for Rockwell. It's been a while, and I'll be honest, I believe in being transparent with everybody. I have not looked at the Rockwell standard in probably two years, and we don't get that question asked a lot. Uh, so I going from belief, which would be, or my favorite method, Tracy, which is the REM, which is uh, the recto extraction method with a little, with a confidence factor on it, because I have read the standard and do know it a little bit more. Uh, great question. I believe you can with the right adapters, not a hundred percent sure. So I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Is it possible to calibrate a test machine in compression and to use this calibration in tension? Because the oh. force in compression is the same for tension. For example, test machine Shimatsu UT1000. Yes. Yeah, so um, caution with anybody. Yes. The uh, That is a great question. So that is one that I defer back to the manufacturing uh, manufacturer of the test machine. Uh, they will usually have guidance on whether that can be switched. Typically, it can be uh, without any problem. So yes, I think the question was, was it possible? Absolutely, it is possible. Further To further clarify things, I would go back to the manufacturer of the machine and make sure that you are going to get the intended result uh, by performing it with that method all the manufacturers that I know will tell you direct, they'll probably ask you the model number and, and give you yes, no problem. But that's also uh, that next webinar on documentation and stuff. This is a good practice to lead into that. Now you've called the manufacturer and you take the notes and you document it. So when the assessor comes in, you can, and they say, why don't you calibrate this intention? And you say on X date, I contacted the manufacturer and was told this, and I got this literature, and this, 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 and you have it all right there for the auditor, and the auditor will love you because it makes their job that much easier, and no one has to dig or find everything, and it can be, right, Tracy? That's right, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so, great question, though. Love, love that one. Okay, just a few more. Um, is okay. the ASTM E74 going to be updated anytime soon? Are you aware of Yes, it is. So E2428 is in the process of getting updated. It's in every, the AST, ASTM generally wants the standard updated every five years. Uh, committee, if you want to join, I'm going to, I'm going to plug ASTM here because someone asked, and I, again, I'm not fuzzy logic, a little bit of fuzzy. I believe it's around $80 for membership. It might be 72. It might be 85. It's under 90 for sure. If you join AS, at ASTM.org, if you join, you can get every standard for that committee. So the E28 is the committee for E74. If you wanted to go by, if you wanted the E4 standard, the E10 standard, the EAT standard, you pay the $80 around there and you'll get a membership with all, all of those books for in that discipline. It is a tremendously good value. And it is also great to get on some of those committees and see what's happening. So I urge people to do that. At the very least, I urge them to become a member because of the tremendous value you get from, from the standards. But absolutely, the ASTM E74 standard will be updated. Things we're talking about are uh, changing. It shouldn't be a major revision. There's a lot of wordsmithing go along that in no case should should be replaced. Uh, things like that that I've seen validated on the E2428 standards. So uh, don't hold my word because things change in committees all the time. But uh, I would I would suspect that we will see a 2023 version. I don't think it's going to happen. In fact, I could tell you it's not 2020. It's not out for ballot right now. So I, I think the it's going to go out for ballot, and we'll we'll likely see uh, ASTM 23. Maybe 22, but that's very optimistic. Right. Okay. As a new calibration lab, is there what type of proficiency testing is available for this calibration and what kind of training is available? Oh, good question. So proficiency testings are weak. You have, uh, and Tracy, maybe you know some more, you have H&N, uh, you have Sapphire testing, and you have NAPT. Those are the three I know of. NAPT is the biggest. Um, I'm friends with Craig. Glunt at Sapphire Testing, also good friends with people at NAPT. But uh, Craig, uh, there are uh, there are tests. 
uh, you can you do not have to always do proficiency tests. You can do ILCs, interlaboratory conditions, uh, where like if you use us and you send a load cell in, we could calibrate that in one of the dead weight machines, and you could use that against one of your other load cells and uh, and do your own uh, ILC. It's the importance is to have your uh, the four year proficiency test plan. Uh, which I forget the section that that meets, but there are several options available. We offer our uh, ILCs, we offer ones through uh, Sapphire as well, and there's NAPT in, in H and, uh, I think it's H and N, that's Henrik Nielsen's uh, H and M uh, proficiency. So right. uh, lots of options there. Um, so what was the second part of that? Qu oh, training. Uh, right. Yeah, we offer training as well. I think uh, maybe Tracy knows some other people offering it. Uh, sign calibration, Ryan Egbert. I, I really like what he's doing. He's setting up a calibration school if you have technicians. If it's more geared towards force, uh, we have an in-house training we're running in October that, that information's on the website. We do free webinars. You can see like uh, PGLA was kind enough to host me for this. Uh, I if you had a lot of people in the in in your company and wanted like a two four hour training, we we could talk. A lot of times, sometimes we'll just do. I'll do. I'll, I'll basically do an hour free almost for anybody at any time if they want some brush ups or anything else because it is passion. Um, but I'm also cognizant of my time, so that's when it gets to the the longer ones. We do have uh, offerings available and NCSLI. Um, they have trainings at their tech forums, um, at their technical sessions. They all went online, and the conference is in uh, Grapevine, Texas. If anybody's around Grapevine at the end of August, and that's ncsli.org. Okay. All right, Henry. Well, this that was it for all the questions for today. Oh, great. Uh, but there's any other questions on the? Again, here's uh, Henry's email. My email as well. I can always pass questions over to him, or if there's anything for PGLA, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Um, and that concludes our webinar for this afternoon. Henry, again, I'd like to, to thank you. Hopefully, we can have you back on Absolutely. different topics down the road this year. Um, and I wish everyone a great rest of your afternoon and a good week. Yeah, thank, thank you, very you much everyone. For your time is valuable and I appreciate you learning something with us. So thank you and thank thank you to PGLA and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.